The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You're Included, author of The Shack, Paul Young, and theologian C. Baxter Kruger share about their collaboration and discuss themes found in The Shack. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Well, thanks for being here, you guys. It's great to it's be with you. It's great to have you here again. Good to be back. Uh, we've never done this together before with all three of us, but uh, you've both been on the, on the program uh, separately before. But since that time, you guys have met and you've been doing a lot of uh, traveling around the world, uh, giving lectures, answering questions. How did you meet? And how did this uh, getting together for meetings around the world get started? Well, I'll let Baxter take the first crack at that. You bet. No, this is Got a great this story. Is, actually, Tim Bursell and the uh, your your guy Tim Bursell in Virginia uh, is responsible for our for our first the, meeting. The uh, Grace Community International Grace Pastor. Grace Community International Pastor. Um, but he wasn't responsible for you getting the book. No, no, but that's for the meeting. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, uh, Wendy Marchant from Sault Ste. Marie, Canada, phoned me, and she says, I'm not getting off the phone until you promise me you'll read a book. And, I, and she made me write it down, and, I, and I've got the post-it note stuck in. I said, William T. William Young, T. the shack, and the ISBN number. And so I said, Wendy, I mean, I'm not, don't do this to me. You know, she said, you, you know me. I'm not. I wouldn't ask you to do something like this if it wasn't really, really important. She said. I said, "All right, what's the book about?" And she said, "Well, I'm not going to tell you." And I said, <laughs> "I said, come on." She said, "Just trust me." So I said, "Okay. Here's what we'll do. Uh, deer season's just around the corner, and I will go get this book by William T. Young, and I'll put it on the top of my deer stand pile, reading list pile." And I did. And so November, mid-November comes along, and I. Uh, I have a, a deer stand that we affectionately call the Cadillac stand, which is, has nicer chairs than these in it. It's covered, <laughs> and it's got three or four books in there. And Anyway, uh, I went to the Cadillac stand, and I started reading. And I'm thinking, well, I mean, the guy's writing a book about meeting God in the, in the woods, in the shack. Maybe it's a whole hunting camp, and I'm clipping along, and then, it, you know, he gets beaten, chained to a tree, and I'm thinking, man, <laughs> what's going on? And then he starts telling about great sadness, and then he starts telling about the, the Multnomah Prince's story, and I'm thinking, I don't think I like where this is going. And then Missy, and man, I'm sitting there crying, and, and then it hit me, and I, and I told Paul, I said, I stood up in, in the stand, and I held this book up, and I said, William P. Young, I don't know who you are, but if you if you hand me the same old, same old, Augustinian, distant, removed, impersonal, unapproachable, legalistic God who watches us from the infinite distance as, of a disapproving heart as the answer to this problem that you've come up with here, I'm going to walk down that path 200 yards and I'm going to lean the book up against the tree and I will personally eliminate this copy from the cosmos. <laughs> And then, man, turn over chapter five, Papa comes out the door. I got all kinds of things going off in me theologically because of my, my um, studies with Professor James B. James B. Torrance and things that he used to emphasize. And this was absolutely astonishing. So um, that was on a Friday. And I couldn't finish the book that. I remember pulling the flashlight out, a little rubber flashlight I had, and I was trying to finish the book. And my son texted me and said, said that uh, he was back at the base camp. So I finished it that night. And then Sunday, um, it was either that next, two days later or the next week, and I, I really don't remember, but my son and I were watching a football game, and I, my phone rang. And I look at it, it's a 503 number, and I'm thinking, well, Sunday afternoon, I don't know. But something told me I needed to take it. And so I answered the phone. I said, hello, this is Baxter. And he says, Baxter, this is Paul Young. And I thought, I don't know Paul Young. Never heard of Paul Young. And he says, you, and I said, well, hey, Paul, how you doing? And I knew he knew that I didn't know who he was, and he was enjoying it. And uh, 
He says, you may know me as William. And I think, well, I don't know William Paul Young, but I'm trying to think it was. Well, surely I met him somewhere. We've talked. We probably sat down and had a, had a beer or something. I don't know. I was just racking my brain. And he says, um, I thought, William, William Paul, William, William P. Young. I said, are you like William P. Young? He said, yes, my friends call me Paul. And I said, are you like the dude that wrote the best book that's been written in the last 500 years? He said, well, I don't know about that. And I said, well, did you write The Shack? And he said, that would be me. And, and I was like, why in the world are you calling me? How the whole world wants to talk to you. Well, Tim Bursell, one of your pastors, had emailed Paul and asked and said, I don't know if you know Baxter, but Baxter's written a theology that goes along with the shack, and here's his phone number. You need to call and talk to him. So he did. <laughs> so, and we talked an hour and a half, and, and I'm thinking, my goodness, because I'm having all these questions like, where did you come from? How in the world did you come to see this? I mean, people that study with J.B. Torrance, you, you, get, you can see the trajectory. But he didn't, he didn't, he didn't know J.B. He didn't know T.F. Good story looking for a theology. That's right. That's <laughs> right. And here's, uh, anyway, I, I was so excited. And so we hung up the phone, and I called Tim. That was in November. I called Tim because I was speaking for Tim and, and Bill when at Bill's church to do a conference in April, that next April. And I said, you call Paul right now before he's so booked he can't breathe and invite him to come to the conference and get him to do Friday. Just tell him whatever he wants to do on Friday, and I'll, I'll take Saturday and do the theology of, of the shack Saturday. And he did, and it all worked out in and we just we had our joining rooms the, uh, that weekend, and we I asked him four million questions because I wanted to know all about how he came to see this. It's a, it's a stunning story, but uh, man, it's just so so rich with great theology that's rooted in the history of the church. And I was I was thinking, well, but he his journey to come to see this was a very different way than the way the Lord had, had brought me to see it. So, which is part of the beauty of the whole thing. You know, it's one thing to have gone through the theological training and come to it, but to have somebody that comes from a totally, I mean, I've got theological training, but I didn't come through Bart or the Torrance brothers or, you know, any of the Trinitarian community. And, um, and mine was much more having to slog it out in the trenches of being a preacher's kid and a missionary kid and having all the questions and not having any answers. And nobody even wanted to talk about the questions. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then having to work this out in my own life to get to the place where I finally felt healthy enough to write a story for my kids, uh, which was the original intention, and um, I'd make my 15 copies at Office Depot and go back to work, not thinking that the thing was going to light up the world the way that it has. So to have those two things come together and, and in such a beautiful way. Um, I was talking to Baxter today on the flight down here just about how grateful I am for for that voice into my life that comes from that traje trajectory compared to the way I've come, because I've come from a, on a very lonely road in a, in a sense. And then, uh, so we've now traveled Australia and, and spoken there and done a bunch of conferences and done a lot of little things. And, and, and it's a beautiful thing because uh, um, our lives dovetail, the theology dovetails, it's, it supports it each other and, and the conversations are incredible as a result. But, uh, your first trip together was in Australia, right? That's and, correct. Uh, mm -hmm. And so tell us about well, some it, of the things the, that happened in, down in there. April, out of the U.S. In April, when I was there and Paul came, I said to him that night, I would love for you to come to Jackson and I would love for you to, to go to Australia with through through our network. I mean, he didn't need me to set anything up, but I just asked, would you go with me? And that worked out. And then it just, from there, it kind of tumbles. And He needed and, somebody to carry his bags. Right, <laughs> right. Um, but I forgot what you said. Well, in Australia, what tell us about some of the things that happened, um, people you met, uh, uh, some of the results of of uh, of your talks down there. Well, the the in, on that trip, what fascinated me about it was the the way Paul's books when he speaks, he doesn't just talk about the shack. He really talks more about his own life story. And people are, some people are prepared for it, some people are not, because he had a pretty brutal uh, childhood, and he opens himself up and just shares his journey. Well, then that means that the minute, you know, you have the end of the, of the lecture or whatever, and someone's singing, I mean, there's, there's 150, 200 people lining up, and they've got to talk. And this is not going to be, would you sign my book, thank you, move on. So I was fascinated by how many people, 
there were some folks that didn't particularly like maybe some of the things he was saying, but by and large, it's like 99% of the people not only loved what he was doing, but they were they wanted to talk. They wanted they were so thrilled and they cried, and it was a moving, uh, liberating, almost like an evangelistic experience. Is the way I saw it from where I was sitting. So let, I'll give you an, uh, an example that Baxter can dive into, and that is. For me, the shack is a metaphor for the heart, the soul of a human being. And uh, it's the house on the inside that people help you build. And for a lot of us, we didn't get good help. And so the shack becomes a centerpiece for the storyline, where you've got a guy who suffers, you know, not unlike um, many of us who've had difficult relationships with our fathers, and there's been the abuse issues and all these things. Well, he manages to, work, to, to make his way, and he ends up with a family and then suffers a horrible tragedy with one of his daughters, Missy. And uh, he ends up having to go back to this place, which is the center of his pain. And uh, with the sense that maybe God will meet him there. And so I'm, I'm drawing this story together because it's based in my own great sadness, it's based in my history. And it's, I'm trying to communicate to my six children who are grown, my youngest is 18. Um, this, I, I want you to meet the God that you've heard me tell you about now for the last number of years, you know, the God that actually brought healing to my life, not the God I grew up with, which is G-O-D, right, is the omni-being watching from the infinite distance of a disapproving heart. And so that's what I was trying to do, was draw them into that conversation. Now, Baxter is reading that whole thing theologically, and so what do you see when when that's happening. Well, I mean, the, it's, it's, it's so beautiful because, and it's a brilliant move because what you did in the scene where Mackenzie goes back into the shack and he goes to meet God, and G O D is a no show because it doesn't exist anywhere but in our imaginations anyway. So he's in the shack and it's dark and he just explodes in his anger and, he, and he, he tears up one of the chairs, throws it against the wall, and a leg breaks and he just pounds the floor. And he screams out, I hate you. I'm done. I've worked. I've tried to find you. Where are you? Uh, you couldn't even bother to let us find her body so we could give her a proper burial. And he just yells out at God and he finally just leaves the shack and he's just pissed. I mean, he's just, just furious. And so he leaves and then things begin to change. Uh, like it's, he said, I think it's something like two months of spring happened in 30 seconds. And now the snow's melting and now the shack transforms or morphs into a um, a long cabin with a picket fence and there's some smoke winding from the chimney and it, I'm reading along the, and he says in the first, then he thinks he can hear laughter coming from the shack. So the first hint that we get of the real God in the shack is laughter. And so he's like, I don't know what's going on here. And I think he goes back and he's stepping up on those steps again. He's thinking he's not sure what to expect at all. And all of a sudden Papa comes out the door and lifts him off the ground, shouting his name as if she'd known him and loved him all his life. And then the next thing he knows is this Asianist looking woman who is uh, almost invisible that brushes up against him. And she says, I collect tears. And then he's standing there like, well, I mean, what? And then a third person appears, which is the figure of Jesus. And he's got, uh, he's in Carpenter's outfit and he's got dust all over him because he's already preparing the coffin for Mackenzie's great sadness. So as a theologian, someone who had the, the, the singular privilege of listening to J.B. Torrance, and one of J.B. Torrance's phrases that he would say a hundred times a day is that he would say forgiveness is prior to repentance. Forgiveness is prior to repentance. Forgiveness is logically prior to repentance. And so I'm thinking... I mean, this is, this is J.B.'s theology written into a story form and without a single theological word, uh, what Paul has done is thrown us into the room where we can feel the total inadequacy of the Western legalism and it rips our souls open and we don't even know what goes on. All we know is we want to be there and be hugged by Papa. Now, the, the fascinating thing is all of a sudden, you, McKenzie's still mad. He's still furious. He doesn't know who these three people are. He doesn't know if he can trust him. He's being hugged, but he's like this. He's bristling. And, and he is already embraced. He's already not, not only accepted, but loved. He's already included. 
the Father, Son, and Spirit, the figures of the Father, Son, and Spirit are already inside of his pain, and he hadn't repented and believed. He doesn't even know who these people are. And it's, it's to me, coming from where I came from studying with J.B., I'm thinking this is, this is the heart of the gospel. That's what the early church proclaimed. That's what was recovered in the Reformation. And then it got lost again in all this rationalistic, legalistic crap. And then it's been recovered again. And now here it is in story form so people can feel it and see it. So I'm, I was just sitting on a deer stand thinking, what is going on here? I was so excited just to see this right there, just so beautifully portrayed. Because who doesn't want to be sitting at Papa's table? And just what did McKenzie do to get there? And where is Papa's table? It's inside his pain. How did, how did Papa, how did Saul did you get inside Jesus' world? And the scene with the garden is the same because the garden turns out to be the brokenness of McKenzie's soul. And there's the Holy Spirit digging around with McKenzie, the two of them working in tandem, digging up issues and pain. And it's the Holy Spirit that's already inside our world of pain. And in our legalistic days, and we got God and over here separated, and until we get it all worked out, they're not even looking at us. And then, and then, Papa comes walking into the garden with a sack lunch, smiling. And that was one of the first things I asked him when I got on the phone. I said, tell me you, you did that on purpose. Tell me that you knew what you were doing. He said, oh, yeah. Well, when you hear his story, his life was shattered. And who, who was it that he met in his pain? But the Father, Son, and Spirit. He's found a way to help us see it and, and feel it with him. I think it's beautiful. If Very we, liberating. If we can't get to the place where we have a relationship with God and the character and nature of that God is trustworthy, we have no hope. So the bottom line question in the shack and the bottom line question in theology is, who is God? What is the nature of this God, really? You know, because frankly, if you can't, if you don't know God loves you relentlessly with a full-on abandon, if you don't know that God is for you, you can't trust him. And a lot of us, you know, the way we've grown up, the way we've been hurt, we don't trust anybody. That's why we resort to control, which is fear-based, because all we got is ourselves. And so, you know, unless we run into perfect love, we're going to be full of fear. And, that, and God knows that. And God is going to work within the context of our pain inside of it in order to ex exchange, in a sense, including us into his life for climbing into our stuff and beginning to heal us from the inside. And part of that story is uh, a part, a part and parcel of receiving that, recognizing you're receiving it, has to do with being able to extend that to others, including those who are the perpetrators of the pain that you're struggling with. Absolutely. And that's why forgiveness becomes such a crucial issue in the context of the story itself. And it's not an event. I mean, this forgiveness issue is a process, and it has to. It goes deeply into Mackenzie's history, as well as it deals with the what he's facing now, and ultimately with himself, because we can, a lot of times, even forgive God before we can forgive ourselves for the mistakes we've made and the ways we've hurt people and and uh, what we didn't even understand, but acted out of. And so, forgiveness becomes a critical critical point. One of the phrases that I used in the book that, you know, and I, you have to remember, I'm not expecting anything from this book except 15 copies for my family and friends. I mean, that's it. I've never published anything, didn't, didn't ever intend to. And, uh, and one of those phrases that I dropped in because, you know, we all hear, well, God loves you, God loves you, which says something about God, but he loves everybody and he loves everything. And, but I use the phrase, uh, I'm especially fond of you which is a lot more about you, right? And, uh, and that phrase keeps cropping up as a manifestation of the certainty of God's relentless affection. And, uh, and, I'll, and I'll give you a little story. I was up in uh, Edmonton, Alberta at a women's prison, and I was speaking at the prison. And, and when I'm done, one of the inmates comes over and she just collapses into my arms and begins to sob. And she's sobbing so hard that I can't understand, she, she can't even get words out and I can't understand what she's saying and finally I get it. What she's saying is, do you really think Papa's fond of me? And I said, honey, he's especially fond of you. And she says, that's all I needed to know. That's all I needed to know. And I'm thinking, 
honey, that's all any of us needs to know. We just don't know it. It took me 50 years to get to the place where I could say with certainty, Papa's especially fond of me. But a lot of the reason I couldn't is wrapped up in the paradigm of theology that I was raised in. We all were. Yeah. Variations on the theme. I mean, when Athanasius, one of my favorite Athanasius quotes, he wrote it when he was 21 years old. He, he said, the God of all is good and supremely noble by nature. Therefore, he is the lover of the human race. And when it's all said and done, the, the issue on the table is, is God really good? Is God really good? Is God for us? Or is there a maybe in his heart? There's a maybe in his heart that we feel that there's a maybe. Mm. There's no way we're going to be able to have any breast or any peace and certainly not love the Lord for any reason other than what we can get from it. And that is the universal way that uh, virtually everybody thinks of God. Yeah. And I, I, met, a, in mind. I met a girl named Jenny. And Jenny is, uh, she, lives in, she lived in Atlanta and a preacher's kid like me. And she grew up in a home where she was basically told, you know, when bad things happen to you, it's because you're bad and the scales of justice have to be, you know, balanced. And so um, uh, bad things happening is a, an evidence of your evil nature, etc. While in her four, and she, and she was a good girl, man. She performed well and all this, but in her early 40s was diagnosed with stage four colorectal cancer, which you can imagine wow. inside that paradigm what that did to her. I mean, it dropped her into a pit of despair that nothing could reach. She was gone. And uh, her husband, John, was trying nothing. Well, friends brought over a copy of the shack because they felt the Holy Spirit nudge them to say, go read her some of this. And she loves them. And so she put up with it with folded arms sitting on the couch while they read the first five chapters, because first four, anyway, whatever that period was up to the point where Pop comes through the door. And finally she just broke. Well, her and John then spent the next two days reading the book. And the book, and the book not the book, because words are words, they have no power to do anything. But the Holy Spirit used the story in the sense of, of manifesting a whole different paradigm of the nature and character of God that yanked her out of her, just yanked her right out of all this deep depression. Well. She wrote me an email and she said two absolutely striking things. The first one was, Paul, I wasn't afraid to die. I was terrified of the look of disgust I would see on his face when we met. So that tapped deeply into the shame that a lot of us religious people have grown up with and feel, right? Because I identify with that. The second thing is even more staggering as far as I'm concerned. She said, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't really know what the difference between God and Satan was, except with Satan, I always knew where I stood, which means with God, I didn't. And see, that's that little shard of uncertainty. Ambiguity on the face of Jesus' Father. Yep. And, and you can't trust him. And, and if God's character is not certain, we have no place to plant our feet. The world is uncertain can't get God's behavior to be certain. And so where do we stand? And I think that's why the first conversation in Genesis about God is between the accuser and the children of God, where the accuser is saying, you can't trust him. He'll lie to you. Holding it's a back. total attack against the character of God. He's holding back. Yeah. Yeah. It's the beginning of all religion. Absolutely. I mean, in the end, if you can't trust, if there's ambiguity on the face of God, then you, do, you really don't want to spend eternity with that being. I mean, you may want to avoid the furnace or the divine rotisserie, but if there's ambiguity on the face of God, if he's split between there's two different parts of the Father's face here, one of them may love me, the other one can't stand me. So you have to love the ambiguity. You have to pretend to love the ambiguity. Pretend to love the ambiguity. And religion will teach you to use the language. Yeah. And then yeah. you just get 550 yeah. variations on what you do to pretend that. But the point is, no one in that, in that situation really wants to be with Jesus' Father. We're just avoiding the punishment of going to the other place. And that's what preaching is. So much of it is uh, you're going to go to hell. So. Fire insurance. Yeah. Yeah, and but I, it's but not I'm talking about, to save yourself. I'm talking about moving in what... what 
what the shack is about and what I see there is Tom, moving to the place to where you, you know, you want to be with this father. You, and, and to me, the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit, and it's a Herculean task. It's an impossible task. It's to, it's to bring us to the place to where we so know how much Jesus' Father loves us that we throw ourselves at him and say, would you please judge me to the core of my being? I don't want anything in me or my way of thinking or my way of being that's going to keep me from sharing in the life that you have with your Father and the Son and the Spirit I, that will keep me from not being able to participate in that. And you're talking about that coming to where that isn't just a platitude, because you hear that there's a platitude, platitude all the time, but it, but as, as a real... Um, you want to be there. You really want to be with him. You want to know him. You want to be known by him. You want to li know life in his house. It's not and, fire and there's insurance. No, there's it's, no fear in, in, no. in that relationship. Because you know? fear is always connected there's to punishment, com complete right? complete trust. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's, uh, but, but you don't just work that up. Well, it's rooted, no. it's rooted in the, the way God really is from all eternity, which is revealed to us in Jesus, but it doesn't square with our fallen minds. No. And that's why no. repentance is so, I mean, repentance doesn't, doesn't bring us to the place to where we accept yeah. love and forgiveness. And repentance is our coming to know it so we can, we can begin to trust and walk in it. Coming to know what's, what, what's, what is already the, the, the truth, the fact. Yeah. That he's for us. That's why I love the scene where they're already in the shack. And what the whole story is about is the Father, Son, and Spirit are, as it were, scratching their head thinking, how are we going to convince Mackenzie that we're good and we love him? Now, how are we going to find a way to reach him? Yeah, how, course, how, course, how are we yeah, actually yeah. going to get there where we yeah. can help him to know who we really are? And he's, Mackenzie's got all this damage that already have all these lies embedded in them. Yeah. And God can't just go in there and surgically remove those things yeah. without tampering with Mackenzie's humanity at the yeah. core and God won't do that personhood yeah. personhood and God has so much greater respect for human beings than we do yeah. that we would think that he would be like us and would go in and tamper with the bad stuff yeah right whereas no there's a respect there and so there is a a movement a relational movement and as soon as you've got relationship like that you've got mystery and you've got a loss of control and you've got things that truly matter coming to the surface and, uh, and that's, the, that's the journey. It's three quarters of the book before Papa finally says to Mackenzie, Mackenzie, you don't even believe that I'm good. Mm. You know, and finally he admits, you're right, I don't. But it yeah. takes all this process before he's at the place where he can even admit that. Let's get together again and talk about this some more. Okay. Great. Be great. Thanks. Thanks, Mike, for having me. You've been watching You're Included a production of Grace Communion International.